I uh, first met the Stephen Singers when I was working in 1957 at radio station KOKY in Little Rock, Arkansas, which was uh, one of the first uh, black radio broadcasting chains in this country. And uh, I became reasonably popular on the station during morning drive and afternoon drive to the extent that it positioned me where I could book concerts. And having worked on the station in gospel, jazz, and then R&B, morning and afternoon drive, I started promoting concerts. And one of the concerts that I promoted was a concert that included the Reverend C.L. Franklin, his daughter Aretha Franklin, who only had one single at that time that was on chess records called uh, Never Go Old. And you ladies may or not <laughs> remember this, I just thought about this. Aretha came out on the stage with what they call a trapeze dress. <laughs> that was, you know, where it fit close to your body, but then it had something from the top down and just got set out while you walked, the wind was blowing in it, and it just, oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I didn't come back tonight. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> and, 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 and so it was with Aretha. Sammy Bryant, who was a gospel midget at that time, the Swanee Quintet, Quartet, uh, and, and the Staple Singers. And I got a chance to go with them in, in, in about five areas of the state. Got to know them very well, became like family with them. The minute I got involved with Stats, I sat. Because I just loved what they were about. Their message music uh, and their unique style of singing. And uh, ultimately, I started producing them. And I produced many hits on them. Uh, Staple singers come go with me, etc. But I had an occasion in my life where uh, I had uh, three brothers that were murdered. They were my younger brothers in each instance, one right after the other. And at that time, I had a problem reconciling death. It was difficult for me, and I was still living with my first baby brother's death, and then added on to that the second next baby brother, and then the third baby brother. And I came, to, I was about to go into the studio to record the state of singers, but I canceled the session, came to Little Rock, and started looking for the murderer. Couldn't find the person I found wasn't the murderer. Ended up going to the funeral, and afterwards, when they had the repass and just go together with the family, I couldn't do that. I went into the backyard of my father's home and sat on a big yellow bus that he used to use to haul cotton choppers and cotton pickers. And as I sat there on that bus, moaning and painting over my brother's death. In my head came, and I can't sing, I can't dance, I don't play a music instrument, my sense of timing is horrible, but I can hear and I can feel it. I couldn't carry a tune in the back of the too. <laughs> but I sat on the hood of that bus, and all of a sudden I heard in my head, dum, da -ba -dum, da -ba -dum, da -ba. <coughs> I know a place, ain't nobody crying, ain't nobody worried, there ain't no smiling faces lying to the races. I'll take you there. And that song was written through me. And it lives in me today, but it brought me to a point where through further studies of the scripture, I found how to reconcile death because I realized who I really was. And that, I think, is the most profound experience that I had with all of the artists. I can tell a lot of things, but that's deep inside of me and it also set me on a direct course in life for the rest of my life. Where I realized I was just a spirit. And that's why I said earlier, a servant leader. That's my position in life and it affected me. The state percentage. Made the state. I know a place, ain't nobody crying, ain't nobody worried, and ain't no smiling faces lying to the racist. I'll take you. 